Chris Jewell, a British explorer, led a team of cavers to the lowest depth ever recorded in the Western Hemisphere, the Sistema Huatla cave system in Mexico. This groundbreaking exploration led to them spending up to 10 nights underground and sleeping in the caves. Would they be successful? Sistema Huatla is a remarkable cave system located in the Sierra Mazateca Mountains within the southern Mexican state of Oaxaca. It's located very far away, deep within the earth, and holds a special significance for cave explorers from all around the world, especially those from the United States and the United Kingdom. For the early American explorers who ventured into this region, Huatla became a passion. This remarkable cave was first discovered in the 1960s and quickly earned a distinction as being the deepest cave in the Western Hemisphere. It also secured a place among the top 10 deepest caves globally. In terms of length, it ranks 28th, with about 55.3 miles of surveyed passageways, in contrast to the expansive Mammoth Cave complex that spans over 420 miles. Sistema Huatla stands out as one of the most complex deep caves on our planet. It has 17 entrances and countless separate pathways that go deep, plunging to an astonishing depth of 5,118 feet beneath the surface. Exploring Sistema Huatla is like taking a journey through time because it has a rich history of exploration. The pioneers who ventured into this cave helped invent new tools and methods that have since become essential for modern cave exploration. Chris Jewell is a prominent cave diver who's known for exploring caves all over the world. He's not just an adventurer, he's also part of the British Cave Rescue Council. In one of his caving interests, Chris decided to take on the task of exploring the intricate passages of the Sistema Huatla cave system in Mexico. To make this happen, he had to make some special arrangements. First, he negotiated to take nine weeks of unpaid leave from his regular job. Then in Manchester, he worked as a software consultant, helping people with computer programs. It's quite a change from his cave explorations. Later on, Chris reached a high point as the head of professional services for the Access Group, a corporate job. There he oversees a team of more than 40 ERP consultants, which means he leads a group of experts who help businesses use their computer systems effectively. But when he's not in the corporate world, Chris is out there exploring the hidden parts of caves all over the globe. He maps out passages that no one else has seen before, witnessing the incredible beauty and mysteries that lie beneath the surface of the earth. The exploration of Sistema Huatla has been an ongoing adventure for the past 50 years. Over this half-century, numerous daring expeditions took place, and these missions are the reason why the cave system is as long and deep as it is today. Back in 1979, during the San Agustin expedition, a significant discovery was made. Explorers realized that if they wanted to delve even deeper into the cave system, they had to either dive underwater or climb upward. This marked the beginning of underwater exploration in Sistema Huatla. Most of the diving expeditions in the cave system from that point onward were led by Dr. Bill Stone, an engineer with a relentless passion for developing new techniques for diving in deep, submerged parts of caves. His dedication to this endeavor led to innovations like the CIS Lunar Rebreather, a special piece of equipment designed for this challenging type of diving. Dr. Bill's work has been instrumental in advancing our understanding of caves like Sistema Huatla. From 2001 on, not much happened in the sumps of Sistema Huatla. Things remained quiet until 2013, when Chris had a plan. He wanted to explore Sump 9, which is a challenging underwater section of the cave. To do this, he assembled a strong team including British cave diver Jason Mallinson. The journey to dive into Sump 9 began with carefully planned preparation that began a year earlier in 2012. Their goal that year was to send a small team into the field, like a scouting mission, to pave the way for a much larger expedition in 2013. Their main target was to conquer Sump 9, which they nicknamed the mother of all sumps. So during the 2012 reconnaissance mission in San Augustine, they achieved all their objectives. 
They also left behind equipment like bolts and ropes in the cave, making it easier to set up for the dive down to the sump in 2013. This careful planning and groundwork were essential for their successful exploration of this challenging cave system. In the following year, Chris took charge and put together a diverse team of 47 cave explorers from around the world. For their home base, the team chose the village of San Agustin, just as previous expeditions had done. Within a matter of days, they had set up a pathway down the famous San Agustin cave, preparing it for the transportation of their equipment. Once this rigging was completed, Jason was all set to go. He skillfully replaced the guidelines in the underwater passage, extending them to Camp 6. Camp 6 was established back in 1994 by Dr. Bill Stone and Barbara Emende, marking a significant point in the cave's history. After the underwater passageways were secured, the team began moving all the necessary equipment for a five-person team down into the cave. They used specially designed dry tubes to protect their gear as they transported it through the challenging sumps. The team used the village of San Agustin as their main camp, just like they've done in previous expeditions. Within a few days, they set up a path through the famous San Agustin cave to move a lot of equipment. In total, they brought 1,102 pounds of equipment when they started on February 28th. After setting up the path, Diver Jason Mallinson was all set to go. He managed to replace the line to Camp 6. Right behind him, they began moving the 1,102 pounds of diving gear down the cave. They took apart the rebreathers and carried their parts separately. They put regulators in Darren drums and kept dry suits and underclothes in roll-top dry bags to keep them dry. To make it easier, they set up places in the cave where they could leave bags for the next team. Soon there were piles of bags at these spots in the cave. They would quickly be taken and moved even deeper into the cave by a group of cavers working together. The team reached Camp 3, which is about 2,378 feet below the surface, and they set it up again quite quickly. This camp was important because the first group of campers, including Jason Mallison, Mark Wright, Martin Holroyd, Pete Ward, Tim Allen, and Jarvis Frost needed to prepare for the underwater part of their expedition. Jason had the task of replacing the lines in the sump. Surprisingly, just a week after they started exploring the cave, Jason was all set to take his first dive in Sump 1. This is ahead of their scheduled time. He got some help from Mike Bottomley, Tom Baker, and Andy Kusick to get into the water. His mission was to put a new guideline through the underwater part of the cave. This underwater section, called a sump, had a guideline put in back in 1994, but after 19 years, it was in bad shape. Only bits and pieces of the original line remained. Jason used his KISS rebreather and managed to replace the guideline in both Sump 1 and Sump 3 in one dive. It took another whole week of hard work inside the cave before the entire team of five was ready to dive through the sumps and set up camp on the other side. Jason was ready a day earlier than everyone else, so he spent an extra night at Camp 6. From there, he could explore and plan the route to Sump 9. The day after they spent their first night at Camp 6, they set off towards Sump 9. They had to carry diving equipment for Jason, as well as ropes and other gear needed for exploring steep and vertical parts of the cave. The path to Sump 9 required them to swim and wade through deep pools of water. To make this easier, they used ropes, some of which had been left behind from their previous visit in 1994. Along the way, they had to climb through a rocky area known as Adams Avenue, but they were hoping that by diving through Sump 7, they might discover a different path that would be less challenging with all their bulky diving gear. So while the rest of the team went around Adams Avenue, Jason got ready to dive into Sump 7. Soon they found Jason on the other side of this underwater passage. They carried the gear a little farther, and then Jason was at Sump 9, all set to make his dive. While Jason was exploring underwater, the rest of the team decided to check out some areas of the cave that hadn't been explored before. They marked several spots they wanted to come back to later. Their main focus was on a place that seemed very promising, the Rio Iglesia Waterfall. The day before, during his exploration, 
Jason had found a way to reach the top of the waterfall, a path that Bill Stone had discovered back in 1994. This meant they didn't need special climbing equipment to get up there. They made their way through the rocky area near Adams Avenue, following the sound of the waterfall that Jason had heard the day before. After a little while, they climbed down to the fast-moving stream and started going upstream, but their progress was stopped by a big pile of rocks. They tried to squeeze through, go over, or find other ways to get past it, but nothing worked. They even did a quick survey to understand the situation better. Eventually, they decided to head back to camp, feeling a bit disappointed. On their way back, they met up with Jason, who told them that the underwater passage had poor visibility and was about 98 feet deep. They all returned to camp together, not quite achieving what they had hoped for. The next day, it was Chris's turn to go underwater. Just like Jason did before, Chris had to carry all the diving equipment through the lakes and big chambers down to Sump 7. Then he followed the line that Jason had set up. On the other side of Sump 7, the team helped Chris get to Sump 8, where there was a big pool of water. Water from Sump 7 was flowing into Sump 8, but they couldn't see it flowing out, so they thought it might be a good idea to check if any underwater passages could lead them further. They carefully examined all the walls, but they couldn't find any way to go. So they decided to move on to Sump 9. In Sump 9, Chris placed a new diving line along the right-hand wall as he went down. The passage started to slope steeply, and he reached a depth of 164 feet. After that, the cave gradually rose to about 15 feet deep before the slope got steeper, and Chris started to ascend to a depth of 20 feet. He had to spend five minutes decompressing before coming back up. Chris had been diving for about 820 feet when he reached the surface of a still and muddy pool. In front of him was a steep upward sloping ramp with a floor that had cracks filled with mud. He was very careful when placing his rebreather on the ramp. Then he started climbing up, trying to find a good grip on the slippery, muddy surface. He crawled flat on his stomach and had to do a short, tricky climb. After a while, he decided that he had gone far enough. If he wanted to go any farther, he would need a rope, and he would have to get out of his dry suit. This part of the cave didn't seem very promising, and it wasn't the main path they were looking for. As Chris made his way back to the diving base, he tried to find another passage where the main flow of water might go. But as time went on, the water became less clear, and he couldn't see any other options. While Chris was exploring underwater, Jason stayed above the water, trying to find different ways to leave the big chamber they were in. He went all the way to the back of the chamber and discovered a path hidden by big rocks. This path seemed very intriguing and worth investigating. Meanwhile, Rich, John, and Myrick didn't waste any time either. They were busy mapping and measuring several smaller side passages farther up the cave. However, these passages didn't lead very far into the cave. The next day, Jason went into the water carrying an 8mm rope. He followed the path that Chris had taken underwater, and once he got to the surface, he took off his dry suit. Without the bulky dry suit, he could move more freely and wasn't worried about damaging it. With the rope, he made sure to secure his way as he climbed higher. However, as he went further, the cave started to narrow down and there were no other dry paths to explore in this area. Even though their underwater exploration wasn't going as planned, there was some progress. At the back of the chamber at Sump 9, they found something interesting. The passage they explored that day, which they named So Long and Thanks for All the Fish, was a dry route up high. It had multiple paths branching off, and even a section that dropped down into Adams Avenue. After several days of diving, they still hadn't found the main path they were looking for in the sump, so they decided to change their approach. Jason Mallinson would go first, using his old route, and he'd place a new line along the left-hand wall. At the same time, Chris would follow his path along the right-hand wall. They planned to stay close to each other so they could locate the missing underwater tunnel. On their way to the underwater passage, they noticed that some of the pools were deeper than they expected. When they reached the main stream, their suspicions were confirmed. The water levels had risen quite a bit, but they believed it was still safe to continue. 
They only worried about getting stuck in the Sump 9 chamber. However, the new route they found, so long and thanks for all the fish, would provide them with a way out if needed. By working together and using their combined skills, Jason managed to discover a tunnel that stretched about 150 feet. He noticed a significant underwater erosion feature, which indicated that a lot of water was flowing into this tunnel. Jason bravely swam into this unknown passage. Chris, seeing Jason vanish into the tunnel, quickly followed him. He laid down a guideline to mark the path he had taken, making sure they could find their way back. Meanwhile, Rich, John, and Myrick had been busy surveying the area known as So Long and Thanks for All the Fish. It turned out that this passage extended for 1,312 feet and seemed to continue further. They were happy that they had finally found the way forward underwater. However, they realized that they only had one more day of diving left before they needed to return. So they went back to their camp to restock supplies and brought more equipment down to the underwater passage to prepare for their final day of exploration. The following day, Jason continued following the same flat ceiling he had noticed the day before. It stretched out steadily as they moved forward. However, they couldn't go too deep because they were using Trimix. And eventually, Jason reached a depth of 266 feet. Beyond this point, it was unsafe to continue. Over a week, the team managed to map 5,820 feet of new dry passages in the cave that had not been explored since 1994. Before they began this exploration, Huatla was the second deepest cave in the Western Hemisphere, with only Cueva Cheve, which is also in Mexico, being deeper. The two caves were just 30 feet apart, so as soon as they started their diving, they broke the record for depth. After Jason's final dive, the entire cave system reached a depth of 5,068 feet. At this stage, their exploration part of the expedition had come to an end, and they had only been in Mexico for three out of the planned seven weeks. But they were aware that the real challenge lay ahead. Down at the sump pool, there was a massive pile of equipment that needed to be carried up to the surface. Before they could finish their work in the cave and pack up their camp, this equipment had to be moved. However, the diving team had been spending up to 10 nights underground without seeing any natural light. They were tired and needed a break to relax and regain their strength before returning to the cave, ready to tackle the remaining challenges with renewed energy. The process of removing their equipment went even better than they expected, allowing them to stay ahead of their planned schedule throughout. By the end of the sixth week, they had disassembled all the equipment in the cave, except for the entrance rope. In the seventh week, Bill Steele and a group of cavers from the United States joined them. They wanted to explore some areas that were part of the old route through the cave. The exploration team was quite successful and discovered more than 1,640 feet of new passages. Surprisingly, these passages had been missed during the original exploration back in the 1970s. When they added up all the data from their surveys, they realized that in 2013, they had mapped an impressive 1.7 miles of new passages. Finally, on April 13th, they completed the packing of their truck and each team member headed home after a challenging but rewarding expedition in the depths of the Sistema Huatla cave system. We would like to thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed watching, take a dive on the like and subscribe buttons and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we come back with another exciting cave diving story.